Welcome to Bangkok, Thailand, and welcome to the pre-Congress program of the HEAT International Congress on Anti-Aging Medicine 2019. This is a significant opportunity to hear, learn, and share experiences with distinguished speakers from around the world who are practicing anti-aging medicine and related medical fields at the frontier of our medical knowledge, utilizing state-of-the-art technology, and integrating latest medical evidences from all over the globe to develop the cutting-edge approach to achieve optimal health for all. My name is Captain Dr. Yung Yut Mayalab. I'm your moderator for today and also for uh, tomorrow and the day after as well. And today's pre-Congress program, titled Holistic Anti-Aging, will allow us to explore issues ranging from hyperuricemia, the impact on cardiovascular risk and kidney failure, followed by updates on the knowledge of food and nutrition with the question of how to eat in six simple steps and achieve the optimal health that we all aim for and how nutrition play a very important role in the intervention of disease and abnormalities. And this afternoon's sessions will take a latest look at the risk factors for cancer and how we can prevent it with the knowledge that we have acquired today and we'll also feature exciting and highly publicized issues of cannabis with the role in cancer treatment and holistic anti-aging benefits. The last part of today's session will focus on exercises and on the new understanding of statins and nutraceutical supplements in cardiovascular disease. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our first distinguished speaker. He's indeed the, um, the host of this three days event, Assistant Professor Dr. Patana Tengam Noi. He Dr. Patana Tengam Noi received his medical degree with the first class honors from Jilalongkorn University, Thailand in 1986, and also board certification in internal medicine and nephrology in 1990 and 1992. Then he went to study at the University of Florida in the field of molecular cell biology, where he earned his PhD degree in 1998. Dr. Tengam Noi is one of the well-known lecturers on the subject of nutraceutical supplements, stem cell biology, and anti-aging medicine. He is a faculty of the anti-aging and regenerative program of Turkit Bandit University in Bangkok. He also serves as a consulting physician for S Medical Clinic and Pajatai 2 Hospital in Thailand, and he's the CEO of Health, Education, and Academics Thailand, or HEAT. So his uh, subject this morning he'll be uh, talking to us about is hyperuricemia, the impact of cardiovascular risk and kidney failure. Ladies and gentlemen, Assistant Professor Dr. Patana Tengam Nui. Open? Okay. It's a very long stage here. So, I promise you the biggest anti aging event in Asia, and I keep my promise that. Most of you, family affairs, come back here again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If some of you, oh, by the way, I can see the back. Do you like them? So wherever you go, you can notice this bag. You cannot miss it. And you know that we are heat anti-aging family. Okay, so say hi to each other when you see this bag at the airport or somewhere else in the world. Okay, we are not no longer stranger. If you listen to my lecture last year, I talk about fructose, the dangers of fructose, and also hyperuricemia. So this year we continue further, and next year, Okay, August 6, 7, 8, during the endings of the Olympic Games in Tokyo, we don't have a chance to go there anyway, so come here. Okay, we may have to televise the closing ceremony of Olympic Games during the event, I don't know. Uh, by the way, next year, I promise you to give you the how to delay the progressions of chronic kidney disease, which is the really, really epidemics right now because end-stage kidney disease has become the biggest problem in the world. And because doctors, sadly, I don't think they know how to prevent them, which is actually is not that So start by this topic, hyperuricemia. Okay, so with this, the uric acid, 
everybody knows about gout, and we think that it's, oh, it's nothing, it's just a joy disease, it has no problems. You need to know that people who, people who have gout have a chance to develop cardiovascular disease, has a chance to develop kidney failures, and they die sooner. So gout and uric acid is no longer just a minor thing. When we talk about uric acid in the past, in the past, even right now, it's not part of the checkup programs. So when you go to the regular cheap or whatever checkup programs, you will not know your uric acid level unless you ask for. You're lucky if you're a woman because women tend to have lower uric acid level, so in women, you're not supposed to have higher than six milligram percent, but in men, we allow you to have about seven. The fact is, if your uric acid level is above seven, it will precipitate and cause problems. And if you drink acidic food, for example, soft drink, diet or not diet, pH is only 2.5, I will show you, you will have another problem because the uric acid, even though it's not as high as seven, it will precipitate easier. When we talk about uric acid, we think about purine. Purine is making uric acid. But what we don't realize is, when we talk about hyperuricemia, you always say, oh, don't eat chicken, don't eat duck. Even you are, vegetarian, you can have hyperuricemia because one third of the uric acid in our body, we make it. We make uric acid, we call it de novo synthesis. So we can make uric acid from ATP, AMP. We can make uric acid if you stimulate it with alcohol. So everything can make uric acid. And because if you have a kidney problems, it's not like a renal failure or anything, but you have a genetic problems, then you cannot get rid of uric acid. You will have hyperuricemia. In Thailand, we don't know incidence of hyperuricemia, but I estimate it's about unbelievable. In men, it should be high, as high as 20%. I used to do other studies. So what is the cause? Part of it is genetics and sex. So men has a higher chance of hy have hyperuricemia than women. And in Asian people, we tend to have a hyperuricemia. Drugs. I hate diuretic. Many doctors use diuretic to treat hypertension. It's true, it's in the guidelines, but actually guide to do what? Guidelines should be written based on the patient's sake, not somebody else. So if you use diuretic for your patients who have hypertension, only one reason, because they eat salt. So if your patients insist of low their salt down from the diet, you don't need to give them diuretic, honestly. Or if you can give them diuretic, you can do sporadically, like uh, once a week, okay, explain to them, it's to remove salt from your system. But if you give them diuretic every day, first you will raise uric acid level in their blood, and the second, you know, every month that the patients who develop hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and have to be admitted to the hospital. Of course, medical school don't know because their bed always full. They never be able to accept these patients. So if the patient has history of taking diuretic and feel weak and some alteration of conscience, please check their sodiums and potassium and you find out the truth that diuretic is not safe not to mention that diuretic cause dehydration, hyperuricemia, and kidney failure. I don't care what guideline is. I used to believe that guideline is written by the expert who have more experience than I do. It would be sad that as old as I am, I still believe in other people's experience because most people who wrote that guideline before me already passed away and now the kids younger than me is writing the guideline. So right now my guidelines is my patients.
My patients are my guideline. If they're better, that's a good guideline. I still read, read the guidelines, okay, but I will not use diuretic. Excess purine food is what you believe. Alcohol, cancer. Nobody ever checked lead toxicity when they see hyperuricemia. And one thing that people forgot is the fructose sugar. When we talk about diet and hyperuricemia, it turns out that actually diet has the very little effect on the hyperuricemia. Small this, and more that. Okay, you can be a vegetarian, you can stop eating chicken, and you still have hyperuricemia. Part of it because of genetics, and part of it that most people don't know is about fructose sugar. The study shows that actually you can adjust the diet, control diet, it plays a little role in hyperuricemia. You can stop eating all kinds of purine food, and your uric acid level will come down to only one milligram percent, not more. So it means if you have a hyperuricemia, let's say nine milligram percent, diet alone would not help, but it doesn't mean we would not encourage you to do a diet control. We do, but you need to understand there's a more than diet that we need to care for. One thing you need to know is fructose. Fructose is part of fruit, all right? Fruit alone contains fibers. If so, if you eat fruit, that should be fine, unless you eat, like in Thailand, the fruit is so cheap, you can eat one kilogram of mangosteen, though it was too much. Too much is not good for anything. Okay, after this, the last year lecture, people say that Dr. Patana doesn't allow you to eat fruit. No, you can eat fruit, moderate amount. Okay, the Buddhist says be moderate. However, right now, fructose is no longer part of the fruit alone. It became the part of something called fructose corn syrup, which is just really, really bad. Let me explain the anatomy of fructose. When you eat table sugar, which is called sucrose, it is disaccharide. It contains glucose plus fructose, right? So when you eat sugar, and suddenly your blood glucose is high in, in the level that's high, and you say, oh, you have diabetes, glucose is bad. And some nutritionist told you that, so you have to eat fructose because it's safe. It doesn't raise blood sugar. That concept is wrong. You have to think that you eat glucose and you eat fructose. So glucose is in your blood. Where the fructose go? Why it disappear and you say it's safe. it's safe to eat fructose because you don't see it? Oh, you, you don't see it, so it's safe. The truth is fructose will enter your cell and damage it all. It will switch itself into triglyceride. Metabolism of fructose will cause hyperuricemia. And however, right now fructose sugar is so pure with fructose. It's not fruits. So I, I, I allow you to eat moderate amount of fruits, but not pure fructose that some people marketing is as a safe sugar for diabetes. Don't do that because it's not safe at all. Evidence show that it's the fructose that cause metabolic syndrome and diabetes, especially in Thailand where we have a lot of fruit juice. So anytime someone show you that, oh, I drink something so safe, it's called fruit juice, Okay, it's not safe. It contains sugar and sometimes it contains added fructose. Okay, like I used to write in articles, okay, why the leading actress need to drink orange juice. It's always routine that the ladies, I want to look healthy, I drink orange juice. Don't do that. You cannot be a leading actress. You can only be a fat actress if you continue drinking fructose. Okay, and I don't know, actually fat can be beautiful, but the fact is, fat can be bad for your health. So the truth about fructose corn syrup is when you eat fructose, you don't feel full. So you can eat more and more and more and more. That's why people can eat one or two kilograms of fruit. Look at the most dangerous of the uh, fruit. It's called soda beverage. Okay, I have to make sure that 
Okay, one bottle contains 35 grams of fructose. So when you drink Pepsi, super size me, you create a chance of too much fructose in your system. It's the fructose. I could explain this thing. Please focus on this one, okay? Why fructose increase uric acid? Metabolize of fructose require fructokinase, and fructokinase will use ATP. One molecule of fructose, one molecule of ATP. ATP switches to ADP, IMP, and that IMP changed by xanthine oxidase enzymes and became fructose. We create fructose from ATP. ATP also purine. So it means we can make fructose if you had a lot of ATP metabolized. Okay, so when you eat fructose, you feel tired because you have ATP depletions, but you can eat more because you feel so good. The brain, leptin, the brain only accepts glucose as a food source, so it means when you eat fructose, the brain says, I'm not full yet, you can eat more, you can eat more, you can eat more fructose. So fruit juice is not safe because it barely contains any fibers. If you want to eat fruit, eat fruit. Okay. Many studies show that uric acid and fructose go hands in hands, and it's the fructose but not glucose that cause fat to stimulate in your body. So after you eat the, about uh, 250 grams, so in the, your text that we gave you, it said 250 milligram cross the milligram. It's gram, not milligram, okay? You eat more than 250 grams of glucose per day, you have a chance of develop metabolic syndromes or insulin sensitivity. In this term, it means when you use insulin, because the fat cell is not very sensitive to insulin, and you have so many fat, you're getting bigger. Anytime you have sugar, you have insulin, insulin tends to change your sugar into fat. So once fat is more fat and getting fatter and fattier, getting bigger, because your fat gets food in the form of fructose. And when you feel like your brain doesn't have glucose, because fat just steal them, you feel hungry. You need to eat more and you get more fat, you get more fat, the brain doesn't get glucose, you eat more, you get more fat. Can you see where I'm going? And then you get bigger and bigger. They say metabolic syndrome has these five criteria, upper shape, abdominal obesity, high triglyceride, low HDL, high blood pressure, high fasting blood sugar. My own studies 10 years ago show that actually there's a six risk factors for metabolic syndrome. It is called hyperuricemia. But of course, experts ignore it. And I'm not, well, I think I'm expert in my own right because I treat my patients. So they never have hyperuricemia in part of the metabolic syndrome. But if you take care of metabolic syndrome, especially in men, believe me, try it and check their uric acid. 70% will be very high than usual. So hyperuricemia is actually one of the risk factors for metabolic syndrome. 10 years ago, even in my hospital, they don't check uric acid during the checkup. And I've been fighting and fighting and fighting. And right now, most of the hospital, except the government hospital, now they have uric acid level part of the checkup. Okay, but the government still believe that it's not necessary to check for the uric acid level unless you have gout. And many studies have proved that uric acid predicts metabolic syndrome. And it's one of the risk factors for cardiovascular risk. So, I didn't say that I didn't stand alone. A lot of people and a lot of study has proved that uric acid is dangerous. Consequence, not only gout, it can cause stone, it can cause kidney disease, it can cause endothelial dysfunctions. I think everybody knows about gout. Well, you're going to have a big toe swollen after you eat chickens and diet coke. Okay, diet, no fructose, but still, coke contains pH only 2.5, which is acidic. 
So everybody knows about gout. You think it's not serious. It's just come and go. You take NSAIDs only when you have gout. Art is wrong. Let's hear these stories. He's an Australian man, okay, 52 years old. He treats hypertension with me. I told him that you have hyperuricemia. And uh, based on the guideline at the time, my, my, the routine guideline, we don't need to treat him. He doesn't have gout, he doesn't have kidney stone, he doesn't have kidney failure. But I keep reminding him that you have a chance to develop gout. He went back to Austria one day, have a steaks and beer with his friends, and he developed knee swollen and pain. He went to see an uh, orthopedist, they tap his knee, they don't see you red crystal, so they say, oh, it's not gout because you don't see you red crystal. They gave him and said, the pain doesn't go away. Then he developed jaw pain. Have you ever heard that temporal mandibular joint can develop gout? No, you never think about it. He cannot eat. He went to see ENT doctor, they gave him steroid. Eventually, he had multiple joint pain, entire body. They sent him to see a rheumatologist and plan to give him steroids and, 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 and all sorts of immunosuppressive drugs now because he became the autoimmune diseases. But most people in this country, I don't know, nowadays, when you cannot poop, you cannot eat, you cannot drink, you have cancer, you have dementia, you have uh, psychosis. They would say, go to see Dr. Patana. So he came to see me because he cannot walk and being diagnosed with autoimmune disease. And they say, gout can have a complex symptoms. So I start giving him allopurinol to lower uric acid. But meanwhile, I need to give him a hip set for about five days. Within two weeks, he can walk. Okay, he can walk again and everything's gone. He doesn't have autoimmune disease. He can just have a complex manifestations of gout, and most doctors don't know. You believe in textbook, it means you don't believe in your patients. Uric acid can cause hypertension. It's the most common cause of hypertension in the young that nobody and most doctors don't know. How to prove it? I have a patient who is 20 years old. He has hypertension already, he's 20-something. 20, 20 and he went to see the most famous nephrologist in Thailand. Should be me, right? Okay. Went to see a most nephro uh, the, the, the nephrologist in the medical school. Oh, check for pheochromocytoma, all the rare disease in the textbook that cause hypertension in the young. But in the textbook, it's not written that uric acid can cause hypertension. Uric acid never been checked. So I check for his uric acid. I treat hyperuricemia, and this day he has no longer have hypertension in the young. If you don't think beyond textbook, you will never learn. If you believe the textbook is written by people who are so experienced, just like me in the past, yeah, I can remember everything in the Harrison Medical textbook, but can I help my patients? I don't think so. I've seen three cases of hyperuricemia and GI bleeding. Of course, again, it's not written in the GI textbook. These people will be old. He has gout, they all have gout, they're all male, and they've been told that gout is not important. You don't have to treat hyperuricemia. You wait until you have gout attack, you take drugs. You don't need to take allopurinol because it's not safe to you. You're old. Let uric high and high and high. So this three case, what happened is, when uric acid precipitated, it formed tiny little needles in your blood vessels. It punctures to your small, tiny little capillaries. So these three cases came with the GI bleeding, and doctors do this endoscopy by uh, swallowing the capsule, of course. They do gastroscope, colonoscope. They see a spot of bleeding everywhere. So they do endoscope by taking capsule and taking picture. They still see spot of the bleeding, hyperuricemia, uric acid level is eight. They don't care because it's not part of the textbook. Two old patients die. The third one, maybe they lucky because 
the relative knows me, then they force me to take care of it. And they ask the doctor, why don't you treat hyperuricemia? Well, the patients cannot eat. You cannot treat hyperuricemia because uh, allopurinol is the oral drug, so we give him steroid. What? The patients have GI bleeding and you give them steroid? That's all you think of any time. Paper, P patients have problem, you give them steroid, you give them steroid, you give them steroid. In everything, you rather call Dr. Patana steroid then. So, I'm going to show you how to treat hyperuricemia without, without a low purinol. I give them 5% dextrose water, a, a, a liter, add with 100 ml of 7.5% sodium bicarbonate. Drip, 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 all day long, all day long. Within two days, uric acid level comes down. Okay, because he's urinate all day long, I hydrate him, I give him sodium bicarbonate without drug. Uric acid comes down, and miracle, oh, GI bleeding, stop. Actually, I make a lot of miracle in my hospital. Sadly, they always think it's a fluke. It's a flu. Okay, so next time when you have older people with hyperuricemia with unknown cause of GI bleeding, don't expect your doctors, a GI doctor, to treat hyperuricemia. First, they don't believe it. Second, they don't know how. It's not written in the guideline. But if you follow and remember this, your patients are your guidelines. Think about it. Uric acid kidneys. And then when we talk about nephrologists, are you sure you're nephrologists? You don't talk like any other nephrologist. Well, if you like the degree and grade. At the time when I look like this in these pictures, put myself in the box and see nothing. At the time, they call me number one nephrologist in Thailand. But that's me. Help nobody. But pass the test and grade, everything excellent. They believe that because you have kidney failure, you have hyperuricemia. That's all they think. So you don't have to care about hyperuricemia because they're going to have hyperuricemia because their kidney cannot excrete uric. Okay, if that's true, if it's true, it means if you treat hyperuricemia, it should not affect with the creatinine level or chronic kidney disease. But every study, including my experience, show that if you treat hyperuricemia, their kidney will get better. So sadly, a lot of patients nowadays receive long-term for life dialysis treatment without knowing their uric acid level. Now, that's the one reason they're going to tell you next year in August that why end-stage kidney disease has become global epidemics. And one of the reasons is because doctors ignore hyperuricemia. The worst part that this afternoon, we're going to talk a lot about cancer, including tomorrow. So all of you who are alternative cancer uh, doctors, please listen. Check uric acid, please. It's not like uric cause cancer too. No, no, I mean, when you treat cancer and patients already have hyperuricemia, if the cancer cells die, the patient will develop even worsen the hyperuricemia. I have a patient who never have any uric acid test. And the doctor just boom, 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 give them the chemotherapy. And after that, the patients develop kidney failure. And the cancer doctor say, I have, to, I have no need to see this patient any longer. Have kidney failure is your, it's your job. You have to treat the kidney failure. It's not my job. My job is to treat cancer. I treat cancer. That uric acid level is 14 milligram per cent. So I have no choice but dialysis to get rid of uric acid. So please check uric acid in your cancer patients before you give chemotherapy or any kind of treatment. Uric acid level and chronic kidney disease go hands in hand. There's a lot of study to prove the higher uric acid you have, the chance you're going to have chronic kidney disease. So please check uric acid. And the funny thing is about this disease, autosomal polycystic kidney disease. You ask all the nephrologists in Thailand or in the world, 
they will say, they will tell in, right into the patient's face that, oh, you have polycystic kidney disease. In this lifetime, you will need dialysis. I have a nice dialysis uh, clinic over there. Okay, whenever you need dialysis, please, this is my business card. You think that the, the patients will come to see you? You tell them that in this life, they will need dialysis treatment. So that patient's their creatine is about 1.6. You know, it's so common that polycystic kidney disease will go hand in hand with hyperuricemia because when you have a cyst in the kidney, sometimes they cannot excrete uric acid very well. So I treat hyperuricemia in patients who have polycystic kidney disease. And then again, miracle happened that kidney failures, uncure, uncurable congenital kidney failure is now curable. So that nephrologists see them again four years afterward. Oh, where did you get your dialysis treatment from? I said, and he said, doctors, I'm cured. I'm cured from the kidney failure with Dr. Patana treatment. And that I don't have a secret. I just check the uric acid and I treat them. So in Japan, there's a, so many studies that uric acid can predict end-stage kidney disease, but I don't know why most people don't care about it. Most nephrologists don't care about it. Maybe because, because. In the past, the drug that used to treat hyperuricemia is cheap, so no one cares about it. But before we go to use the drug to lower the uric acid level down, we are holistic doctors. They're going to give lectures, the last lectures of this meeting. And by the way, we follow by the nice light dinner for you, though. OK, you start by diet. Even though diet can reduce uric acid less than one milligram per cent, but if you do all this combination, you can see the difference. So start, yes, you cut down red meat, you can change into vegetarian if they can. A lot of meat doesn't have to be chicken. Every meat contains purine, so yes, you have to cut down all the meat. Cut down the fructose is very important. You can eat fruit, but in moderate amount, but no fruit juice and no soft drink and cut down the alcohol, especially beer. Turns out that vitamin C can reduce uric acid. Not much, maybe 0.4 milligram per cent, but it's better than none. The other things patients need to understand is alkali diet. And the best supplement that I showed you before that I can use it in the IV forms to reduce uric acid level down without the need of drug is called sodium bicarbonate. In Thailand, we sell it's very cheap. You can find it tomorrow. I don't know how much they sell it here, one bottle. If you can use the motorcycle, boop, 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 out there, five or very cheap pharmacies, they may sell you 1,000 tablets for 100 baht. This meeting, because it's so beautiful, I may charge you 400 baht. It's still cheap. Hey, 1,000 tablets for 400 baht is not bad, because if you go to my hospital, 1,000 tablet will cost you 6,000 baht. Six baht each. And we have to take it three tablets in the morning, three tablets in the evening with empty stomach. Okay, Paul, this is a good gift for your friends and family when you go back home because I don't think you can find it in your country. Well, I take it back. Actually, you can find something cheaper. In America, we call it arm and hammer baking soda. Or you want something, a nice pharmaceutical touch, we call it Alka-Seltzer. In Thailand, we call it E, no, E and no. But since E is a bad word to call ladies in Thailand, right, E, you cannot point at the ladies, call her E. And no is even worse, you call her E and then you reject her with no. So I make my own E, no, and I call it I, yes. <laughs> and don't forget hydrations. And don't forget hydrations. So make sure you get sodium bicarbonate, OK? And then talk about it. I feel tired. I can take sodium bicarbonate. We know I don't have hyperuricemia. I take it every day if I remember. It feels very good. Tastes bad, though.
Okay, the side effect is you will fart. You hear me correctly. You will fart, which is good. You know, remove gas. And some people, you will pee a lot more. So, minor side effect. Uh, on the side, they say don't use in kidney failure patients. It's been written here for like 60 years ago when people have no knowledge. Don't listen to them. Okay? You can use it, and you should use it in patients who have kidney failure because the studies show that baking soda delay the progressions of chronic kidney disease. To prevent hyperuricemia, you have to choose less acidic food and eat more alkaline food. But why people say lactate, acetate, keto, we have a ketogenic coming, is alkaline food. Because its metabolite can turn into bicarbonate. So when you exercise, you get lactic acidosis. Okay, you drink mineral water, it switches into bicarbonate. When you have ketone, okay, acetoacetate, it will switch into bicarbonate, as well as the vinegar, it will switch to bicarbonate. So vinegar, even though it's acidic, is alkaline food. Fruit, citrus fruit, is acidic fruit, but it switched into alkaline food. And when you exercise, lactic acidosis is good for you. It will switch into bicarbonate. We need to hydrate. It's important. Long, long time ago, people who didn't do well at the medical school been taught that when you have end stage kidney disease, you need to restrict fluid because you have no pee. You cannot urinate. And then because these doctors don't understand the basic sign, they just come in and purchase the MD degree and try to use it. So they believe that everyone who drinks more water will have kidney failure. It's not true. It's only when you no longer have the kidney. So the advice for the end stage kidney disease cannot be used with the people who still have the kidney, even the chronic kidney disease. You need to drink more water to get rid of uric acid. And better yet, it has to be alkaline water. In, Th in Thailand, we serve a lot of reverse osmosis water. Reverse osmosis water is, is someone believes it's so pure and clean. It lacks minerals. It has no mineral content. It's like distilled water. I don't recommend you to drink reverse osmosis water. However, in certain parts of Thailand, in America, when the, board, when the water is so filled with salt, they have to use the reverse osmosis system to get rid of it. For example, in Phuket, it's difficult to get rid of sea salt from the water. However, still should not get rid of that far to become reverse osmosis water because it contains no minerals, and the pH of reverse osmosis water is only 5.9, so it's acidic. One time I speak like this, and one of the nephrologists says, I'm an American board of nephrology. I never heard any studies about it. Well, doctors, you can do your own study. It doesn't have to be published. This is my study. Look at the pH of soft drink is 2.37. Even the diet Pepsi, diet Coke is 2.37 or 2.4. So when you drink soft drink, diet or not, you are eating acidic food. No, oh, now you know why you're getting old so quickly. Keep yourself alkaline. Reverse osmosis water, pH is 5.9. But if you purchase the dirty reverse osmosis water, they sell in the tank, they sell in the machine because the machine has not been cleaned. It contains some heavy metal. The pH goes up a little bit to six something. Doesn't mean it's better. The better pH has to be above seven. The better yet, the better uh, than 7.4. So M red is fine, M red is fine, Aura is fine. And I'd like to thank our sponsor. You know, you're so lucky to have this water in front of you. Please share. Please share. I don't want to see that after my speaking, after my lecture, you start grab every bottle on the, bo on the table. <laughs> it's 40 to 50 baht each. Thanks to our Icelandic sponsors who provide us with this 
precious drink from Iceland. Because why? pH is actually, if in the glass, it will be 8.5, and it contains less solute. Less solute means you don't have silica. OK, so, but you can use uh, underground water like sink and chang. When, when the isolated is gone, you have to go back, uh, out there, and we will serve you with sink water, which is underground water, contain minerals, but maybe salt a little bit higher. And tomorrow, during the uh, event, you're going to see the machines that can adjust the pH, we call Kangen water. You can adjust level the pH to 8 or 8.5, but the test will be funny. And be careful, because the uh, alkaline minerals will contain a uh, high content alkaline minerals. It may precipitate now, so you have to drink it fresh, quite fresh. So you choose, but one rule is go for mineral water, avoid acidic water, such as soft drink and reverse osmosis water. We've been talking about the importance of hyperuricemia, and I tell you the patient's case and, and, and my experience. I hope I convince you to know that you need to know your uric acid level. Women has lower, maybe you are fine, but men, if you don't know uric acid, and one day you have kidney failure, don't blame me, I told you so. We don't want to focus too much on the uric acid lowering drugs, but we need to talk about it anyway to make it complete. So what it is? It starts by xanthine oxidase inhibitors, uricosuric agents, uric case, which is not available in Thailand yet. And funny thing is, antihepatitis drug like losartan can lower uric acid, OK? And the antilipid drug like phenofibrate can also lower uric acid, but that's not indication that you should use. If you're going to use losartan, it's because the patient has hypertension. If you're going to use phenofibrate, it's because the patient has serious hypertrichyceridemia. OK. Uricosuric agents, I will skip because I will not use it. Why? Because it's for gout people who has no kidney failure, no kidney stone. You must hydrate them. You must give them soda min and the drug interactions can be fatal. So when you order uricosuric agents, the patients can be in trouble because they can develop kidney stone. Uric acid will come down to the kidney, and if they drink RO water, like most doctors recommend them, it's mean you change uric from the blood and change them in, make the kidney become the wasteland for the uric acids. Don't do that. So I usually I will not prescribe uricosuric agent because I'm a kidney doctor. I'm not supposed to damage the kidney. The gout doctor does not give a damn things about the kidney, right? So we will focus on two things, xanthine oxidase inhibitor and uric case. Xanthine oxidase will prevent uric formations from the novel synthesis of uric acid. And uric case even better because it will change the uric acid into allantoin, which is safe, and we can pee it out safely. The problem is right now is uric acid is not available in Thailand yet, but it's coming, it's coming. And I heard from the initial study that the result is very good. I would love to try that if it's no toxic side effect. Let's talk about the xanthine oxidase inhibitor first, why the doctor is so afraid of it. That drug is called allopurinol, even though there's numerous studies show that allopurinol can lower risk of chronic kidney disease, that nurse nephrologists refuse, refuse to prescribe allopurinols. They rather give dialysis to the patient. They say uric acid is secondary to the kidney failure. You don't need to give them allopurinols. But the studies show that giving allopurinol will reduce the progressions of chronic kidney disease. Right now, if you search the internet, I don't know who put it there, not me, but you see my name. Every week in my clinic, there will be a new case of chronic kidney disease come to see me because they want help. They come from everywhere right now, everywhere. I have no secret. I cut down the amount of drugs that they take because drugs can be toxic to the kidney. And I'm so serious about hyperuricemia. I give them the treatment for hyperuricemia, and usually, in most cases, their creatinine level is coming down, it's improving. Allopurinol is not just for gout, because 
uric acid can cause endothelial dysfunctions, suppress vitamin D production. So by giving a low perinol, I found that many patients have less risk of cardiovascular diseases. But a low perinol has serious side effects. So in America, they prescribe like 600 milligram per day. Don't do that in Asia. When you start a low perinol, go by 50, which is half a tablet, half of the small tablet. Have a tablet a day and follow up the uric, follow up the creatinine levels. Go with the lowest amount of allopurinols that make the patients better. Don't harm them with the side effect of allopurinols, which is attack of gout, hepatitis. They always have a dry skin, so you need to advise them about the soap they use, dermatitis, fixed drought eruptions, and the one that we are so afraid is Steven Johnson syndrome, like in this picture, can be fatal. Never see one in my lifetime. Because if you care for the patient, you explain it would not really happen because you not should allow these things to happen. You know why it happened? Because the doctors in this case don't understand something called drug interactions. The patient's taking allopurinol for years. They're doing fine. They're doing fine. So the doctor will say, oh, you're not allergic to allopurinol. You've been taking allopurinol for years. But suddenly, the patients come to the hospital. The doctor increased dosage of statin from 10 milligrams a day into 80 milligrams a day. They prescribe macro antibiotics and other antibiotics. And they prescribe, you know what, they'll prescribe omeprazole or very routinely aspirin, blah, 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 blah. Most drugs will compete at the liver for the C3 enzymes to metabolize, and the one to lose is allopurinol. And Johnson happened because of drug interactions. One drug may be okay, two drugs, three drugs, multiple drugs, the way the doctors give to your grandma nowadays is bad. So the hospital forced me, said, before you prescribe allopurinol, you have to check for HLA B star 5801. Actually, it's not guarantee, but well, if you have positive HLA B58 C01, you have a higher chance of allergic to allopurinol, so you cannot prescribe allopurinol. So if you're not so sure, you can send for this HLA B5801, okay? In the past, I challenged them, low dose, and tell them, explain if there's any skin rash. But right now, I sent this HLA first. But still, even though with this HLA, I still need to advise my patients because there's also drug interactions. So if you take antibiotics, maybe you have to stop allopurinol for three days. If you go, one need a statin, come talk to me, go with the low dose. Please don't, don't go high dose. I told you that most doctors don't care about hyperuricemia until three years ago. <laughs> and I thought it's because of me, how foolish I am. It's not me. Now, hyperuricemia has been the topic in the kidney society of Thailand. In the past, everyone ignored it. Now we see uric acid checkup in every program checkup. And I thought it because of my lectures in the past, now people realize the importance of hyperuricemia. No, Dr. Patana cannot speak as loud as the pharmaceutical companies speak. Because allopurinol costs only 10 baht each or even lower. A new drug coming in costing about 100 or more, 150 baht per tablet. It's a new xanthine oxidase inhibitors, and they launched this campaign about hyperuricemia. And suddenly, the doctors go to the meeting, hear about this medicine, so they care about uric acid. And now they check uric acid. Okay, you want to use expensive drug? Fine with me. It's better than none. So, my last slide is, you need to understand that diet alone cannot treat hyperuricemia. You need to understand that pure fructose is dangerous, so fruit juice is not safe. You need to know that if you need, okay, you need to do the alkaline treatment, alkaline food, 
advised them to drink mineral water, plenty of them to get rid of uric acid. You can try low uh, vitamin C, 500 milligrams a day. If you want to do a xanthine oxidase inhibitors, like they have kidney disease, hypertension, kidney stone, and gout, go slow, 50 milligrams of allopurinol. If you want to check for HLA-B, 50A01 is fine. Target uric acid level should be less than 6, or at least 6.5. Beware of the drug interactions. Febusosat is expensive, it's new. We don't know much about the drug interaction and side effect, but I believe there will be some. So, one thing for sure, if you don't believe anything, please read more. We cannot wait until conventional doctors realize significance of hyperuricemia. People who have gout have a chance of die of cardiovascular disease. They have a chance that before they die, they will receive a long-term lifetime dialysis treatment. They have hypertension. Hyperuricemia can be cause of the GI bleeding in the elderly, and it's the cause of hypertension in the young. So if you don't believe me, please read more. But now at least you know, you need to know your uric acid of yourself and your patients. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.